This is Out of the Box with your host, Jonathan Clark. Out of the Box, Sunday nights at 9 on Q1043. Luke and Adam from The Struts are with us. The new album is pretty vicious. Stone Pony, Asbury Park, August 3rd. All the info, thestruts.com. We haven't had a chance to speak yet about the new album, so I'm glad you're here. Uh, I want to get to that. I want to speak to you about this event you've participated in called uh, Soho Sessions. And this particular one in support of uh, Every Town for Gun Safety. Uh, for all the info on that, go to everytown.org and the Soho Sessions.com. Uh, you guys are based in L.A. now, right? Is that correct? That uh, is, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I'm sure you're aware of this, but in the United States, for decades, it's been an ongoing sort of partisan struggle to uh, pass, you know, common sense like gun safety laws and you know gun safety and and i'm sure you're aware of it but i'm assuming in your home country of england um many other countries it really isn't so so Mm. talk about that and and your involvement in this i mean yeah you already sort of brought up the the most obvious point us being um british which i think upon really coming to the states for the very first time one of the I guess the biggest culture shocks that I think we all found as a group, uh, especially spending a lot of time in California, was well, just how accessible it would it was it was for sort of anyone. Um, how easy it is, right? Yeah, I, and I, I, you know, you hear about it and see it on various documentaries that have been made, and um, and even as things as trivial as like even watching movies. But I think once you actually step foot um into the states and you see the reality it is a shock and like when we were growing up i i think i mean gosh like i don't even think any of us as individuals had ever seen an actual firearm unless it was a shotgun at at like a hunting a farm or something like that um Mm. and i i guess the worst things that you know, a lot of uh, British young people could possibly witness or experience would obviously be like knife crime or something along those lines. Uh, but yeah, like an actual sort of like firearm would be completely alien uh, to, to people like us. So it was an ongoing um, culture shock that we right. were very surprised about. Well, you mentioned television and movies, and I think, Mm. you know, you guys watch television and movies growing up. I did, too. And from the United States perspective, we would see, you know, guns like in every cop show and every detective show or whatever. Mm. And if you saw something that was an English film or an English television show, you know, the Bobbies, the police, Mm. no guns ever, a stick you know, yeah. uh, a, bu- a bully club or whatever mm. like that. So it's just really interesting. And it's just obviously the, you know, the statistics just really stand out about gun crime and, you know, mm. uh, the UK and European countries as opposed, you know, to the United States. It's just insane. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I mean, to be completely honest, um, a cause like this as as like a group didn't really... I'm not saying we weren't interested in in being in a part of something like this before. It was always something that we felt um, strongly as a group and uh, talked about privately um, with each other about, again, going back to the culture shock. But it really wasn't until we were recording our last record where we did it all in Nashville and we had been, been there multiple, multiple times, never experienced sort of anything personally. Um, we'd see bits and bobs on the news but halfway through recording the record we were at a a bar called the red door which was sort of like a place that we would always go to um, close by our hotel and we would always wind down with like a couple of drinks and put songs on the jukebox and we actually experienced um, someone shooting up the actual bar itself and that was like a real well life-changing moment because like we said hearing reading seeing things on the internet that's one thing but when you are in the outdoor smoking area and you hear like the shots and there's that initial moment where you think is that like an engine backfiring like what is it firecracker and then someone comes running in and says everyone hit the deck 
that's like a really scary experience and for a lot of people in that bar it was i can only imagine how traumatic it was i remember when we all hit the deck and i could see the flashes from the handgun going off and girls and and people like around us all on the floor were like crying being sick with like fear and before we knew it like armed police came in probably about 12 minutes afterwards and it's a long time it was yeah a less a long time and i yeah. remember it's weird there's this moment where you're led down on the floor and you can hear the shots going off and there's a there's a thing that goes off in your brain where you either panic or you have to i know this sounds really strange but it's almost like coming to terms with like the terrible um threat of what's going to happen if that person comes through the entrance and finds his way well, into the main you bar you can't understand it unless you've no, been there you know what no. i mean like and that i think despite us being foreigners to this country i think it gave us like a real actual experience that we can draw from and upon reflection when hearing about the various like school shootings that happen in the states every year um it gives you like just a even if it's just a small sense of what people have experienced and the fear uh that they've unrightfully had to go through it it really hits home Luke and Adam from the Struts are with us. The new album is pretty vicious. Stone Pony Asbury Park, August 3rd. All the info, thestruts.com. And they are participating in this event uh, called uh, uh, Every Town for Gun Safety. Get all the info on that, everytown.org and thesohosessions.com. So pretty vicious, the latest album. Out for about six months now. Is that about right? Something like that. Um, you guys yeah. been touring and- every been touring everywhere since it came out uh this album with a new record label too big machine tell us about this album where you recorded it and um you know working with producer uh, julian raymond uh well we it was it was a co-production <laughs> with let's get that in there we it gotta was, do that <clears throat> it's the band's first co-production with a producer and we also had the the head of the label scott bullshetter as well right oversee the production so it was kind of like a a three-way uh, group, <laughs> a group a effort. Word. Yeah, a three-way group ever of of really bringing and driving all the songs um, home. But it was quite funny. We were just talking about, you know, the ne- next steps of of new music and whatnot, and I completely forgot like the actual timeline of a lot of these songs that made the album. How long we actually prepped to get down to those, you know, eventually the songs that made the record. And it was quite a while. It was some some tracks were pre-pandemic uh in any of the tracks that you were playing live before you went into the studio yeah or? we had one called mm. do what you want which made the record which changed quite dramatically in tempo and a little bit of the arrangement um pretty vicious we didn't play live but we had recorded a really great demo um in 2019 and even yeah there's a there's a couple of other tracks like rockstar and uh, I Won't Run, which were even older ideas that we'd sort of had. And every band has those tracks that they're just floating in your sort of like atmosphere. Waiting and, to be Yeah, plucked. and for whatever reason, you just can't get them right. And right. And all of a sudden, it's you have like a deadline. And you're like, oh my God, okay, we really need to finish this. Well, that, that can be helpful, having a deadline, It does, right? it does. Yeah. I, I, I do think we we work a bit better when we have like a, a deadline to work towards. And um, yeah, we're really proud of the record. It's sort of, I guess in many ways, it's it's the closest to us sounding live uh, like we've done compared to things that we've done in the past, um, purely because it was really essentially us in the room. I was doing sort of like guide vocals so everyone knew where they were in the songs. Um, but we also had a couple of additional musicians which really sort of raised everything and, and made the song sound a lot fuller from the from the get-go. And yeah, we just sort of actually really took our time with it. And I think people can hear that. And it's been getting really great responses and the, the single Pretty Vicious itself is, you know, did 
really really great things for us so. um it used to be that english bands would come over to the states for the very first time and you know they would play while they were touring different cities across america all within the country of america and the united states but a lot of english bands perhaps in the 70s felt that like man it's like a like every city is like a different world it's like a different place is it like that now because I, I would think that touring in Europe every day or maybe every other date you are in another country is it is it that noticeable in Europe and is is America like every different venue is sort of like it's almost the same what's it like now yeah I think you're right I think especially with the the coasts for instance like the east and and the west are very different worlds and and then you have everything else and europe is just way smaller or at least feels smaller anyway right um but yeah i don't know if adam sort of agrees but i think the the notion of touring around the states because we've done it so much and so consistently for a while now that we're kind of like desensitized by it if that makes any sense i I was just thinking about this this morning um i flew in from uh london yesterday and landed here and you know flew in on my own and you know and i uh it was my it's my brother's birthday today so i just sent him a message and i was thinking gosh in 2015 if I was flying to New York for the first time. It would, it would have been such a big event. Right. My mum and dad were like, did you get there all right? And like, you know, double checking like times and catching <laughs> the flight and whatnot. And I think now just, you know, flying to and from and doing shows here and there, it's, it's, it's now just become completely second nature to us. How about you, Adam? How do you feel about that? And, you know, touring in America now and uh, Europe now? Yeah, I think... Um I think Europe still does feel like different countries. I think initially, I think some states here do, like when you go to like Louisiana or something like that in New Orleans. But a lot of them, a lot of the time, if we have a day off, we're usually by a beige strip mall and it's like, <laughs> oh, yes. or, or a mall. So they all kind of look the same. Um, but in the cities, uh, I think a lot... I think there is some differences, but I think Europe is a lot more different. But in we were just talking about because th- the other three of us came in from LA, and we're like, oh, I'd love to live in New York. But I was like, I don't want to because it still has that magic, like excitement when I, every time I come here. Whereas like LA, I used to have that, but now I live there, it just kind right. of feels like home. So um, no, it's it's still exciting. But yeah, we've gone around this country so many times it's crazy now I, I i grew up in new jersey i've lived in manhattan for years now but i remember the first time i went to la i had to rent a red convertible you know <laughs> what i mean i just had to do the, like the whole thing i mean going to la you know from you know everybody thinks oh cold dreary england or whatever in la it's all sunshine what were you really excited to sort of make that move to to los angeles yeah, I think it's, uh, especially at the time in the band, because it kind of, um, we had essentially been dropped by our label in the UK and kind of kind of at a fork in the road and then luckily kind of went the right way and ended up going out to LA and we were just kind of like, oh wow, here we go. And I think, I mean, I'd, I'd been to America once before that. I think all of us have been once or twice, but yeah, it was definitely a... A huge shock and uh but then we were straight in we had a tour it was sold out and then we did G- jimmy kimmel straight away and it yeah. was like you know a couple of months ago we were playing in a pub like <laughs> you know so it was uh really exciting and that yeah and it still is you know la is still exciting but it's yeah. just it's, it's just lost a little bit because yeah. we're there so often now <laughs> i definitely think we found our audience a lot more in the united states um I wouldn't say effortlessly, but it just felt... Oh, you guys definitely worked a lot over the past few yeah, years. Yeah, it wasn't I mean, without effort, but yeah. I, I guess in terms of... Uh, it just came about so naturally. I think when we arrived on the scene and we had Could Have Been Me Out and newly signed with Interscope, and like Ad said, we were doing all these really cool, great first looks. There was this real organic, natural synergy. And I think the the relationship that Americans and English people have had musically has been so uh, strong for such a long time. There's almost like this unspoken 
uh, undescribable thing that bands from both sides of the Atlantic have that you can't really explain but whether it's uh, Americans inspiring the English or the English vice versa or even the English sort of giving back American music in different ways and flavours like it's always just been this cross-pollination which I think just still carries on to this day. I have a great book for you to read in case you haven't read it. Um, Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath, his book Into the Void. He talks a lot about that and it's just fan- whether you like Black Sabbath or not, I mm. mean just so many incredible cool. stories about, you know, what we were just speaking about, you guys, you know, coming to America for the first time. Uh, I want to play Pretty Vicious in just a few here, but I want to ask you about a couple things that you were involved in. Um, uh, for the Love Rocks NYC show mm. uh, earlier this year in March. We're the sponsoring radio station for that. Uh, and I was there at the Beacon Theater back in March. I saw you do the cover of Bohemian Rhapsody. People's jaws were on the floor. I mean, that is a very ambitious song to cover, obviously, vocally, range-wise. I was blown away by it. Uh, tell us about that and that night overall, because it was pretty amazing from looking at the audience. It was, it was amazing. I mean, truth be told, I didn't really think about my song suggestion probably up until about 48 hours before the show. <laughs> uh, I remember I was speaking with John Varvejos about the song choices and I remember I was just sort of relaxing at home and and he offered me to do it the year before and it just didn't work out. I'm, I think we were pretty busy uh, on the road or recording or whatever it was. So we we definitely confirmed that I was going to do it and John was like okay what do you want to do blah 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 now I, I just thought what could I do that would just be so bombastic and I was I was meant to have two songs so I thought okay I'll do Born to Run by classic Br- by Bruce right, yeah. which is stupidly epic into Bohemian Rhapsody <laughs> and I thought yeah that will make an impression <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know, John later came back and was like, look, look, like we're getting tight, tight on time. You got to pick one. And I was like, okay, I'll do bow rap. And then when I got to the rehearsal the day before, it suddenly dawned on me. If you ever, if you've ever seen Queen uh, do Bohemian Rhapsody live, when it comes to the operatic section, they always had it on tape. They never, they never did it live. There was Ooh. no, you know, choir. There was no BVs even attempting anything like that. And I remember I turned to John and I was like, wait, wait, how are we going to, how are we doing the operatic? Kind of important to bring up. Yeah. yeah. And he was like, oh, it's it's fine. It's fine. The MDs sorted it out. And I was like. Will oh. Lee. I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. So I met Will and then he, uh, he told me, he was like, yeah, we've got the, we've got the, the backing vocalists doing it. And I was like, and then it dawned on me. I was like, oh my God, we're about to attempt the track and, and also perform it in a way that I personally as a huge fan of the song and, and of the band of course have, have never seen done like that and uh, yeah I have to say we, we did go through it quite a lot I think we must have done it about four or five times uh, between the two days the day before the show and the day of to, to get it absolutely right and they absolutely nailed it and I had Larry Campbell in here, guitar player from that band. Oh yeah, the yeah. Guy with the beard. And, yeah, he yeah, was great. Yeah, he yeah, was yeah. so fantastic. And yeah, it was such a rush. I mean, that venue, just in itself, being on stage, and the way that it's laid out, and just how beautiful the room looks, and classic Shakespearean type. Theater. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. and uh, of course, being surrounded by other incredible artists as well. That was a massive, massive. Uh, bonus for me but yeah it was great I was I was I was actually a little bit nervous <laughs> uh, I mean come on <laughs> bow rap I mean it's not the easiest song to sing no but know? I I I I remember I remember telling John he was like you've ever done this live before and I was like I, I've done it a few times live with uh, my mum at karaoke <laughs> down the pub so I think I'll be all right so well, well speaking of that did you you played with Queen at the Taylor Hawkins Mm. tribute did you also do bow rap at that or like what tell, tell us about that day, no cause... we we did uh we did the version of we will rock you that queen used to sort of like open up their shows with um, okay yeah in the mid 70s and it was also 
a song that uh, when I would jump in and, and, and do a bunch of Queen songs with Taylor and Chevy Metal, that was one of the ones that we oh, always did. Right, yeah. So, yeah, we, Dave and Pat, of course, once I was recruited to, to do that performance, definitely made it sort of like a point. They were like, look, we know that before, you know, Taylor passed, that you guys were going to be doing sort of like a, a run of shows with a whole bunch of sort of like the old Queen uh, songs. And they were like, we really want you to, to do uh, at least a couple of tracks or this one specifically, because that's how you would have done it. So Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even that was like... Insane. With Brian and Roger, right? With Brian and Roger, yeah. And, um, Jeez. But it, it's funny, like, I, I obviously staying close contact with brian now and we sort of send each other voice memos and and stuff over uh text and i did send him the uh, the video from the love rocks performance and even he sort of like turned around and he's laughing his head off going fucking hell Luke. like <laughs> you know i've never i've never seen or heard anyone trying to attempt that song like without the track and i think his exact words were nothing scares you does it and just sort of like yeah left it at that but he, well, no he's you, really cool when you have the choicest uh session studio guys from the new york city music scene mm. as your backing band those guys can pretty much like do everything right yeah i, mean, I was in very good hands and i wasn't nervous about whether anyone else was gonna mess it was purely just um just me uh, that i was kind of worried about but i i am hoping to to do it again next year so Oh, good. We look forward to that. We are with Luke and Adam from The Struts. Uh, their new album is Pretty Vicious. They're playing The Stone Pony in Asbury Park, August 3rd. Get all the info, thestruts.com. One last brush with greatness. I need to ask you, Luke. I hear you have a pretty awesome Paul McCartney story. Oh. <laughs> Maybe there's more than one. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I've told the, the, the one from the, the, the Taylor tribute concert. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it was very random. I, I don't think a lot of us knew that Paul McCartney was going to turn up. I think when someone of that uh, s sort of stature is included in the show, it, it, you get told about it very last minute. And there was this huge, huge sort of fantastic after party um, underneath the the stadium. And um, everyone's just running around. And of course, you can only imagine the emotions that are running through that room and the surrounding area it's like it, it's sad but yeah it's like electrifying and joyous and there's a lot of sorrow as well so it's really it was really just sort of very emotional and then I remember being sat on a sofa with um uh Josh Homey from Queens who I'd met and I was hanging out with him for the whole week and he's He's a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we broed down quite a lot. And I met the guys from Rush. Uh, Getty. The and day before. Alex, and, yeah. and we we were sort of really um, having some great chats because, of course, like Taylor was obsessed. With Neil, especially. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, I remember it was guys from Rush, uh, me and Josh, homie, and then Paul were all sat there. And I was like, this is this is quite the sofa I'm on. And um, <laughs> I was trying to cut down on cigarettes at the time. So I, I had like this, this little silly vape, um, like a strawberry flavored one. And um, <laughs> I was just sort of like my, not minding my own business, but you know, just sheepishly sort of like. Taking it in. Being involved in the conversation. And Paul had some really sweet things to say about my performance work, which, you know, I'll, I'll never forget, but he, he saw me like hit the vape and he was like, um, you know, what's that? And uh, I, I, I said, oh, it's just like a little vape. And he asked me if it was weed and I was like, no, 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 no. And he was like, oh, okay. And I was like, do you want some? So he like hits it and then walks off with his martini and whatnot. And he's doing the rounds of yeah. speaking to everyone in the room. And uh, every sort of like six minutes, he kept trying to find me and asking me for the vape again. And you got then, him addicted. Yeah. And then he actually ended up spilling his um, his martini all over my lovely olive soup. And you never washed it again. And he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. And he starts trying to like suck it out of the lapel. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell is happening? And uh, yeah, I still have the vape. Oh, you just got, yeah. just sat on my 
on my uh, on my shelf, <laughs> just just there. Paul McCartney the smoked this. Yeah. Yes, uh, it is Luke and Adam from the Struts. Uh, the new album is pretty vicious. Everyone, go out and buy it if you haven't already. Go see them live on tour this summer. They're going to be at the Stone Pony in Asbury Park, the Summer Stage, the outdoor venue. That's on August third. And get all the info at thestruts.com. Luke, Adam, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. This is Out of the Box with your host, Jonathan Clark. Out of the Box, Sunday nights at 9 on Q1043.